Yeah, it was like a good couple years before I was in like a drama where they were going like Academy Award nominee so and so, and then it was Academy Award nominee Anna Kendrick, and I I was like, oh. Oh my God, that's me! Um, like where you you sort of are like in your apartment going, oh, that, that's me. Nobody's here, but that's me. <laughs>
I did a good enough job that they were like, yes, we will represent you so that you can audition for, here it comes again, the Broadway revival of Annie. Um, because you could either go to a cattle call or you could get an agent, and I think a lot of agents were doing that at the time, just like, we'll represent you so that you can go to the kind of official audition. And I did not get Annie, but um, I ended up retaining that agent. They were like, oh, well, you got called back a couple of times, so we'll keep you on and we'll have you audition for more things that are specifically musical Broadway things, because that seems to be what you do well at. Um, and then eventually, I, my poor parents, because we lived in Maine, um, got tired of driving me five in hours. <laughs> um, so uh, they said that by the time that I was 12 and my brother was 14, they were fine with us getting on like Greyhound buses and going from Portland to Boston and then Boston to New York. And I uh, know, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and I auditioned for High Society and I got a call back and they said, so you, can you come back tomorrow? And we had been told, you just say yes, no matter what, you just say yes. <laughs> so uh, we were like, obviously, because we totally live here. <laughs> and um, we went to like the cheapest hotel in New York City that we could find and our parents um, faxed a copy of the credit card and <laughs> I heard, oh good, <laughs> um, uh, faxed a copy of the credit card and uh, called the hotel and were like, don't worry, we'll be along shortly. <laughs> like our children are checking in, but obviously we're coming. Um, and, we, and I like washed my socks and underwear in the hotel sink and I went in the next day and auditioned again. And they uh, asked me to stay again. And you go, obviously, no problem, not a problem at all. Did the same thing and the woman said, um, do you, cause I'd worn these like combat boots and she was like, um, because I was auditioning to play like the daughter of an heiress, and uh, and she was like, "Do you have anything like nicer?" And I was like, "Ma'am, I'm in a cardigan. Like, I don't know what you want from me." <laughs> and uh, she went. She was sort of referring to my shoes. And so the other thing that we did, uh, we, my brother and I woke up the next morning and like went to Payless and bought like church shoes. So then I'm just in like my ratty jeans and my chunky cardigan and like white church shoes, which I, I don't look any classier. I just look confused. And um, and I uh, yeah, I think. We spent like the last of our cash on the Payless shoes. Thank God we already had our bus tickets home. And, uh, and then when I was on, when we were on the bus home, um, we got a call, like we turned on our, you know, early days cell phone and uh, found out that I got the job and we were like quietly celebrating in the back of a Greyhound bus full of sleeping adults. Oh wow, I have so many follow-up questions. <laughs> I, guess, I guess the first thing I want to jump to though is so you go through all of that, you're surprised to get the, the audition and then actually book the role and then you, you eventually wind up a Tony nominee at 12 years mm. old. What was it like getting that kind of recognition that young and how did it reshape what you thought your path going forward was going to be? Um, I think I didn't totally understand what that meant, like what the history of the Tony Awards, I mean, when you're 12, you just, you can't really have that kind of perspective, um, which I think is probably good. I think it would have been a little overwhelming. Um, obviously I knew what the Tonys were and I, I was familiar with the concept of awards. So it was like, oh, that's great. That means I'm doing a good job. Um, and I was excited, but I, 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 the like kind of magnitude of it wasn't super, uh, present to me, um, but I did actually work with um, Margot Martindale years later, and she was like, we should start a club called I Lost a Tony to Audra McDonald, <laughs> because so many people have. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then actually, I saw Audra McDonald at the Tonys a couple of years ago, and she was like, would you take a picture with my daughter? And I was like, oh my god, what is happening? <laughs> and her daughter was like 12, and it was a whole thing um, for me. She didn't care. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I think I, I, I definitely thought like this is, this is good, they did a good job. And, uh, but I think that I wasn't super prepared for the fact that that didn't mean that like everything was gonna be smooth sailing from then on out. Um, Cause I think that actors have certain gifts 
and sometimes there's not a place for those gifts yet. And that can be really frustrating and demoralizing when it shouldn't be, but you can't help but sort of internalize, like, but there's no place for me. Like, I, I thought, I did everything I was supposed to do, and there's still no place for me. Um, especially on, on Broadway, I would get invited to, like, really workshop these shows that were in the development phase. And then by the time that they would be ready for Broadway, I would be too big. Um, so it was very like, I felt sort of embarrassed that I'd had this success and then I was like, oh, I'm like a has-been at 14. Um, and yeah, like there were, there were many moments l like that in my, in my career where I was like, isn't this supposed to mean that, that things just go well from now on? And yeah, it's, it's always a, a struggle. We chose such a shitty profession. <laughs> <laughs> Challenging profession. Challenging, for sure. Challenging and it brings a lot of uh, light into a lot of people's lives <laughs> out there, mine included. You, you bring up that happened a couple of times and the first thing that came to my mind was Tony nominee at 12 and what were you, 18 when you became an Independent Spirit Award nominee? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Seven, se mm, yeah, 17 or 18, I guess. I feel like even though that happened for you so so young, there's a lot of people out there who look at the success of Twilight and that they're like, that's Anna Kendrick's breakout opportunity. Right. Are you sitting there and going like, a breakout? I'm a Tony and Independent Spirit Award nominee. What are you talking about? Well, I will say it's very humbling to be a Spirit Award nominee and be so excited and have a bunch of people go, what is that? And you're like, it's a big deal, you guys. Because um, I was so excited and I happened to be, um, I think I was in New England at the time and nobody knew what I was talking about, but um, I was thrilled. And um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I try to be realistic about like not everybody is seeing these very small films and so it makes sense that they would be like, yeah, that girl from Twilight. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I also have sympathy because I think that I met um, uh, Victor Garber when I was 12, and I was like, you're the guy from Titanic. So you know what I mean? You know what I mean? We've all been there. It's a good point. It's a good point. Um, talking about camp a little bit, a first big set experience like that can make a pretty big impression on you. So what kind of expectations did that production set? And then did the ones you hit after, did they meet those expectations? Yeah, well, camp was such a great experience because it was every, it was, um, well, it was non-union, so woof. Um, but that did mean that it was every actor's first film job. So nobody was like, everybody was going, how do I do this? How do I act in front of a camera? Like, I mean, truly something as simple as like the, the camera's facing the mirror and that means that when I'm actually looking at you in the mirror, it doesn't look like I'm looking at you. I have to look somewhere else. Like blew my mind. And at least every other actor on that film was having that same experience of just like adjusting to acting on camera. And um, I think we had a kind of theater and dance, because a, a lot of people were from theater or from dance, um, that kind of work ethic. But I was very f glad that we were all like making fools of ourselves on a regular basis, having no idea how to act in front of a camera. Given the fact that you were lucky enough to have an experience like that early on, what's, what is a seemingly silly question that you wish that more newer actors out there would have the courage to ask when they oh, hit their God. first set? Oh, you know what? It took me, uh, there was like some, and I'm embarrassed to say that this did not happen on camp. It didn't happen on my first union job. I think it was like maybe my fourth movie or something where a bigger actor just sort of turned to the A camera operator and was like, what's the frame? Here, 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 here. And it was like the first time I'd seen somebody ask a, just a question like that. And because he was like a famous guy, I was like, oh, you're allowed to do that. And I just thought, especially sort of coming from theater, that oh, when you're acting in front of the camera, you're not supposed to be thinking about the camera. And um, I think that I, it was a new concept to me that you could hold both things, you know, that you could not be um, letting your awareness of the camera uh, negatively impact your performance, but that you could be using it as a tool and that you could be changing your performance based on the frame and like really knowing the 
um, the technical aspects of acting in front of a camera would make you better, you know, rather than like trying to be a purist. Again, I think this was like just a theater idea that I had that I came in with of like, I, I can't be thinking about things like lighting and camera, you know, that like I just have to be like living in my truth and, um, and the camera shouldn't affect me at all, which is ironic because then I became so interested in being the person that knew exactly how to help camera, how to help the, the editor in the future, how to help the cinematographer, how to kind of know as much as I could about the technical process and like be the person who knew like, oh, if you're on a longer lens, then when I'm, you know, giving, handing this prop over, I need to do it more slowly. Like I wanted to be the person that um, knew everything so innately that I could perform while just having all of that knowledge of camera in my body. And it was just, it's funny, because it, like for a, the first couple films, I was like, oh, I'm just not, we're not, we don't talk about the camera. <laughs> like it's the elephant in the room that we don't talk about. <laughs> about knowing a little bit of everything yeah. <laughs> and, and having an understanding of what you can do to elevate someone else's work and it works with every single position on a set and it makes I mean, the movie that was my that better. was my aspiration anyway yeah. yeah for a really long time what is the project that got you your sad card um i think it was rocket science um i well and i say that i think because i would then want to say that the next movie that i did there was some kind of like snafu where they were like, well, you rep represented yourself as a SAG member and I wasn't, or something, I don't know, but it was like one of those horrible things where you're like, oh, I uh, have trusted people to take care of these things for me and I should once again <laughs> remember that I need to be hyper vigilant and responsible for myself. And I don't even remember really what happened. It, it got taken care of pretty quickly, but, and maybe it was a misunderstanding, I'm not even sure, but oh my God, the terror. <laughs> the terror when that happened, yeah. But I, I think it was was rocket science. You which live was, and yeah. you learn, and mm -hmm. then you fix those mistakes yes. later on. Um, we already brought up, uh, I guess, the term breaking out. I'm always fascinated by that because what it means to break out can mean something very different from my perspective compared to maybe the person mm. experiencing it. So what would you say is one of the biggest misconceptions about breaking out in Hollywood, but then also when you had your breakout, what was something that you really did feel changed for the better? Oh man, um, I'll say that like it, it is consistently humbling to have somebody come up to you and go, my buddy says you're famous, who are you? You know, so, so even now, it's like, have I, did I? You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's, you know, like a daily exercise in like, thank you, Lord, for teaching me humility. <laughs> um, so, it, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, I'll also say that I think, obviously, Up in the Air was a big shift in my career. But um, the people that responded to Up in the Air tended to be um, a little bit, older, uh, and by older I mean just not 17, and um, you know, would maybe notice me in a restaurant but not say anything. And then it wasn't until Pitch Perfect when it was like, oh, the fan base is like 14, 15, and they're gonna come up to you. <laughs> and um, they're really excited, and it's like very vocal and exhilarating. And so I think that there was part of me that was like, oh, was I just fully not famous before this? Um, because, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was a funny, like, different style of recognition or, or fan base or whatever. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Up in the Air was one of the very first things I ever covered in this line of work, no! and I will never forget it. I made a point to read the book, and I studied up, and I loved the movie. Oh, you did not need to read the book. <laughs> I kind of liked the book. I liked the book, too. I'm just saying, like, you're such a hard worker. <laughs> to a fault sometimes. Um, before I get too far ahead, I always like asking this question about auditioning, especially mm. early on in your career. Can you tell us about one audition high where maybe you didn't book the role, but something felt really good and you wanted to hold on to it, but mm. then also an audition low and what you learned from that low that you could apply to future auditions? Oh, man. Um, this is a weird one that's really, oh, this is really 
arrogant. This was late, like later in my career, but this was years ago. That um, there was something I auditioned for that was that had music in it, and I won't get specific. Um, that uh, I just knew I'm not going to get this job, and they're going to hire someone who can't sing. <laughs> and I just felt like so happy that I was going in, and I felt really, I felt proud of my vocal performance at least. And I don't know, I did just feel like, I, I think I did a really good job and that's the only time that I get to perform that material. And I'm really proud of how it went. And like, you guys are gonna hire someone who can't sing. And you're gonna be in the recording studio at some point and you're gonna be like, why do we hire somebody who can't sing? But um, yeah, I don't know, that was just my own personal petty <laughs> gratification. <laughs> um, and they did. Um, but <laughs> No, um, but, uh, and I don't, I don't even say that, I, I very much think of myself as like an actress who sings. I have been on many occasions in front of people who are really singers and I'm like, I'm gonna sing so quietly. <laughs> but, um, and then I think the, the audition lows were, I don't know, there was, it's hard to think of like a specific story, but certainly just that kind of, um, I don't know, th there were these kind of mixed messages sometimes. I, I don't know why this one, like, I remember this one. It was just for like a, a, a procedural or something. And and at the, and I think I was, you know, in the scene, I, we were meant to be standing and they asked me to sit and I was like, oh, can I stand? And they said, no. I know that's so silly, but I was just like, oh, and it kind of like threw me. And then, but then the weirdest part was then at the end of the scene, the character like storms out and I just stopped the scene and they were like, go. <laughs> it was so, and I was like, so I do some of it, but not all of it, like, oh, just not feeling, um, I don't know, just feeling like you don't have the power to say, I would like to stand for this scene, just makes you feel a little, it's a little dehumanizing. I don't know, I can't imagine saying that to somebody who would audition, that, I don't, like, you can't do what makes you comfortable. I don't know if you went through this on the film that you just directed, but what, based on your past audition experiences, if you're in the room for other auditions, are you able to do to make sure that you make the potential actors feel comfortable and you can bring the best out of them in, in that environment? Yeah, I, I didn't get to read, you know, we were doing Zoom callbacks um, and I, I, I really felt like so, oh, I can feel it now. Like I can feel how much I wanted everyone to feel that I was so grateful that they would even give their energy to me. You know, like you feel so responsible and having been on the other side of it, I was just like, I felt like I was practically in tears every audition because I was so like, I hate the idea that I, I can only give this job to one person and you're gonna be so generous with your energy right now. Um, and I, yeah, I think, Basically, I tried to be like as specific as I could. I, I felt like that was actually something that came up once we were shooting as well, was a lot of people, you know, producers or whoever were, were sort of like, oh, I didn't know you could say that to actors. And I was like, we're, I don't know why, there's this repu, I mean, we're crazy, but like, we, there's this reputation that we're these like mythical mist creatures and we'll just like disappear into a puff of smoke if you say the wrong thing to us. Like if you say, can you do it a little faster, that we'll just explode or something. And I, I, I was consistently surprised with how much people wanted a little fucking specificity um, because you like, Sometimes, if, especially like if once you have a little bit of a relationship with somebody, you can talk about like these big ideas and you can get a sense of how they like to communicate. But I felt like especially in the audition process, like a little specificity was really helpful. And I, I mean, I hope that was the case. I don't know for sure. But um, it, I think it also, when someone gives me a specific note, it feels more like, okay, you're happy with the direction that this is going and you just need to tweak it. And it's not like, okay, um, let's go again. And oh my God, I once got this note. <laughs> um, I once got this note that was like, you're so great. And I just want you to believe in how great you are. 
okay, let's go again. And I was like, what does that mean? It was so, I was like, oh, it's, it's like unusably bad. Like what kind of a note is that? Um, it like, it got in my head so much because yeah, just tell me like, oh, when you're doing this, it's not really reading and whatever, like wonderful, because that means it's mostly working and I just need to adjust a little something. Uh, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm definitely not opposed to like, poetic, big feelings, notes, or direction, but um, yeah, I, I think that like being specific is one of the more helpful things for, for me. And I, if anything, I was worried that I had to remind myself like, Anna, not everyone is you. Everyone has a different process. All of those processes are beautiful and valid. Mm -hmm. And um, I was surprised by how much like I would sort of start to do like the poetic thing and I'd get like a blank stare and I would be like, just if you just tilt your chin up a little higher, it's gonna work. You know, like, <laughs> not that, but you know what I'm saying? I feel like this is kind of unfair to ask this question so broadly, but for a flip side to that note idea, do you remember a time on a film when someone gave you a hyper specific note and in that instant, so you felt all the difference, like that was the key to cracking a scene? Totally. Um, I. Uh, there was something where I was supposed to have just heard bad news and um, and the shot was kind of like a three-quarter profile -y thing and it was like kind of a maybe like a waist up medium and um, and I you know like I the bad news hits me and I'm just like totally living in the truth of that thing and it's I can feel it in my body and my chest and my eyes and it was like we kept going again and going again <laughs> And then um, I think the I think the director just said, when you get the bad news, just open your mouth a little bit. So I just went, <laughs> and like I was like that felt like nothing. That felt insane. And then I watched the shot and was like, yeah, that's all that I needed to do. <laughs> and I'm totally for the moments where you want to live in the truth of the feeling and what you're going through. And then also I really. Genu uh, generally like love the weird puzzle that is filmmaking and going like, I also don't want to do it 25 times if it's not working. So if it is something really simple, like I'm very pro, like let's let's all figure this out together, you know, filmmaking, sol probably, uh, problem solving. I have so many big broad questions. They're just like flooding my brain as you're giving these answers. I love asking this question. You already mentioned that there's so many different techniques out there. Can you name an, uh, an actor, a co-star you had, where you had a very similar approach to the work, where the second you hit set, you were immediately in sync, but then also give us someone with a completely different approach to the work who maybe challenged you to adapt and try oh, something new yeah. for the better? Oh, um, yeah. Someone very, very similar to me is uh, Jake Johnson. And um, Jake Johnson just directed his first feature and asked me to be in it and because uh, he and I had done Drinking Buddies together and uh, I was so happy to be working with him. I was so excited that he's directing and like just have a very, very similar uh, kind of approach and thinking about the edit and you know thinking about all that. And then um, someone very different from you is Sam Rockwell. Um, mm -hmm. And he like is just so, um, God, how do I even describe it? It's hard when it's not your process, you know? Um, but like this kind of beautiful chaos, and I can be very kind of rigid and, and hypervigilant, and, uh, and he is so free, and um, I found that challenging. Um, and, but I remember like at the end of the movie texting him, like I I'm so grateful and I learned so much from you, and um, I think a big part of that was I hope to take like a teaspoon of that process and bring it into my work um, because I think that sometimes I can be too rigid or too hypervigilant or um, too much of like a like a literal technician or whatever. And um, and he was really able to um, just like prioritize his performance over. Um, I think that sometimes I can, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes actors take on the feelings of people around them. <laughs> um, I, I can take on like the anxiety of the AD and I can end up feeling like it's my job to do everybody else's job, which no one asked you to do, Anna. Um, so I think that there are times where I'm like, it's fine, I'm happy, it's fine, we can move on, it's really fine. And, um, and Sam really knows himself and um, that, 
was really apparent in his process. To build on that, what tools have you come up with over the years so you could free yourself of those pressures that aren't your own? Um, well, <laughs> I, I actually, I felt like Alice Darling was where I was trying a lot of different things, um, but there was a point where I could feel myself um, you know, in the many things that were different about this particular movie, there was a point where I could feel myself starting to um, feel like it was my responsibility to push the set forward and do the AD's job, which is common for me, but I think especially with a lovely Canadian AD, uh, I was like the shrill American on set, and I was like taking on that, guys, I think we, we should just shoot, I think it's ready, we should just shoot. and. Um, and there was a day where I was like, I think this is ruining your performance. I think this is also ruining your um, experience of this set, which I'm trying to remember is important. It's not just like the thing that it is later on, like when it comes out a year later, that the experience of making it has to be valuable to you too. And I literally just was like, it's gonna be really hard, but tomorrow it is not your problem if we go over or if we don't make our day. And it was really wild because suddenly, like in any given system, like someone else will take on that anxiety, someone else will take on that role. And to trust that was really hard, but also film sets are a really fast moving system. So if it like almost took like barely a couple hours before it was like other people were going like, guys, why are we not shooting? Come on, come on. And I was just like, I, I feel very relaxed. I don't know what you guys are being so uptight about. I'm just the chillest girl on set. I feel like you can apply that mentality to just about any profession out there. Um, I'll go back to my little roadmap here. I have to ask about the experience of getting nominated for an Oscar. You already talked about how like you didn't really understand what a Tony nomination meant when you were that young, but it's been a good while since Up in the Air. So how has the meaning of what, what it means to be Oscar nominated, how has that changed for you over the years? Oh God. Um, well. <laughs> I'll say that the first time that I actually saw, this is so silly, but the first time that I actually saw um, in a trailer, like Academy Award nominee Anna Kendrick was like two years later, because I think I'd done some comedies and so they didn't, you know, like sort of uh, flash that around. So it was a it couple, it was like a good couple. For the Twilight sequel? <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? Um, uh, but yeah, it was like a good couple years before I was in like a drama where they were going like Academy Award nominee so and so, and then it was Academy Award nominee Anna Kendrick, and I I was like oh oh my god that's me um, <laughs> like where you you sort of are like in your apartment going oh, that, that's me. nobody's here but that's me <laughs> um, yeah that was uh, that was really exciting because I think especially because there was somebody else in that trailer where you know they were. Um, it felt like, oh, I'm part of um, uh, like a little brotherhood or something. Um, it felt uh, really beautiful and I felt very proud to be in, in that category, I guess. Is that, that's corny. I'm being corny. Corny is nice. Okay. <laughs> I'm Great. someone who deeply values award season and the opportunity to celebrate people's hard work. So anybody who appreciates the opportunity to go through that experience <laughs> fills my heart. I mean that honestly. Um, a new moon slash up in the air question for you because yes. correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you filmed those back to back if, simultaneously. If, simultaneously, I assume that was the first time you ever did something like that. Yeah. So what did you learn during that experience about what it took to film two movies at once? Um, I'm glad that I did it at 23, is what I'll say. Um, uh, yeah, it was especially because the new moon. Uh, stuff that I was shooting at the same time as Up in the Air was mostly night shoots. So I was very like discombobulated, but it was such an exciting time and I was young. And um, so the kind of like red eye flights were fine, you know? They were like a mild inconvenience, um, whereas now they'd like flatten me. Uh, so yeah, I think um, it was also funny to be like going from uh, set to set and seeing, um, you know, George who'd been famous for so long and I mean so famous, you know, and then getting back onto the new moon set where, you know, these guys had, were so famous 
but they just got famous and were like adjusting to that. And like just sort of being just on the outskirts of that kind of fame was, was really interesting. And it was also like, that's a lot. That is not something that I, we should probably aspire to because that is like oppressively, uh, prohibitively famous. Um, and I, I also, well, I don't know, I, I, oh God, even as I'm saying this, I don't know if this is true, but I feel like I've had the benefit of being kind of like a small female. Like I think people tend to not kind of like grab at me in the way that they might with a male um, celebrity um, or feel like they at least approach me with slightly different energy. Sometimes the energy's fucking weird, but <laughs> it's mostly okay. And, um, and but as, as I'm saying that, I don't, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a crime, but that wasn't really true for Kristen in a lot of ways. So um, yeah, so as I'm saying that, I go, I don't, I don't know why it was that way for her. It makes me very angry, but. You know, I yeah. can't imagine going through stuff like that, but she powered through. She's yeah. crushing it now, as are you. Yeah, she's the bomb. Um, sticking with uh, the Twilight films for, for something that might seem like a, a seemingly silly thing to ask about, but I know you've spoken in the past about like being really cold and like miserable because of the <laughs> environment. What, what, is, what is like a technique or a tip for yourself that you've come up with over the years when it comes to dealing with something like environmental like that or something that shouldn't really be a concern, but like it honestly is to you? Oh no, I mean being cold, as somebody who runs cold, being cold and like being in a little dress because it's supposed to be spring is genuinely like, oh, this is going to be a really hard night on the job. I feel like I purposely asked this question for tips. No, I'm always cold. I, no, I, I um, so I, again, like I just um, did something a couple weeks ago on my, the film that I was making where I asked this girl who was even smaller than me to be very, very cold and like lay down on the ground for a really emotional scene. And I was on my hands and knees in the costume, in the wardrobe trailer, like putting um, body warmers, you know those like uh, therapy patches? Yeah, y'all know. Um, uh, those like heat therapy patches that are for like sore muscles, like on spanks that would go under her um, uh, costume and like, uh, you know, foot warmers, hand warmers, um, and like layering that under a, a layer and keep it like I was just the idea that I was doing this to someone was making me like physically ill. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I I was definitely <laughs> that was a moment where I was like I know that this isn't my job and I I don't in this particular case like I don't care I need to be here or I'm gonna explode with anxiety. So I was just like making a suit of armor for every part of her that was like allowed to be covered. Um, Cause that's generally the way that I've um, survived. I will also say that as a lady, if you are uh, put in a costume where you can wear tights, like nylons, those, uh, this, I've, I found out about these a good couple years ago and was using them, but I think they're popular now. Those fleece leggings that look like this, the, 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 they're just nylons, game changer. Full blown game changer. So um, ask for the nylons because when it's not super cold, you can just wear the nylons. And when it's super cold, you can wear the leggings with the nylons underneath. That's, yeah. I like it. I'm just back pocketing ideas for Sundance now. Yeah. On to one of my absolute favorite ones. I love Scott Pilgrim. I love Scott Pilgrim. So, so much. That is a very, very specific style and tone. <laughs> and I have a very hard time imagining reading a script like that and fully being able to picture the movie you're going to be in. Yeah. So when you're on set shooting that, how do you calibrate your own performance in a way that you know is going to suit the whole? Well, first of all, I would like to preface everything I'm about to say with <laughs> I adore Edgar. I love Edgar, he's the best. Um, but he does think of you as a human puppet, um, which uh, like took me some getting used to. Um, like uh, there was a day, this was like maybe the second day on set where um, Mary Elizabeth Winstead was sitting next to me and uh, we were doing a big long take and then they called cut and she went, and I was like, oh God, she's crying, what's going on? Oh my God. And I was like, are you okay? And she looked at me and she was like, and in, in, in the kind of voice that you would use to say, oh, I, I have allergies, it's nothing. She went, oh, Edgar doesn't like blinking. <laughs> 
So <laughs> she'd been holding her eyes open for the whole take. Um, and I think now he removes them digitally, so. Um, but uh, yeah, he's like a super, he's like a painter, you know? And I adore Edgar and like, I love his movies and I love like being inside of his brain when I go and watch a movie of his in the theater. Um, but it was like a very hyper-specific style. And uh, I think that reading that script was definitely an exercise in like, well, I loved Sean and Hot Fuzz, so I'm sure this is something, but the script was very confusing. <laughs> um, and also the script was uh, like laminated in this silver so that you couldn't take a photo of it or it would show up as, I, I don't, yeah, I don't know. But I thought that technology would become really um, uh, prevalent, but also maybe the maybe our phones are just better now, and it would still take the photo or something. I don't know, but um, it felt very like top secret and cool to get like a silver script. I always like poking around the special thanks in credits. Oh yeah, and you got on Baby Driver and The World's End. Yeah, how did that happen? Um, well, we were together when uh, when he was writing both of those, and so there was lots of like, um, yeah, you know. We, whatever. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool to have some of your favorite movies be Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, and then yeah. get to move on. No, well, have and, a hand in that. And somebody, um, you know, recently was going through my uh, like top five movies, and I always tell Edgar, you know, Hot Fuzz is my second favorite movie of all time. I get it. Um, so I like was just texting with him, being like, somebody asked me about my five movies, so you know, I was talking about you. Yeah. I don't blame you. It's a solid choice, um, given what you just told us about nailing the tone for something like Scott Pilgrim. How did that compare to tackling a movie like A Simple Plan? Because I've heard you talk oh, about- Oh, A Simple Favor. I, oh, no, oh my God. It happens all the time. It happens simple, all the time. I love A Simple Plan. I love A Simple Plan. But I also love A Simple Favor. It happens all the time. <laughs> a Simple Favor. I've heard you talk about getting on set and like you and Blake looking at each other and being like, well, what movie are we in today? Yes. So what was that experience like versus Scott Pilgrim? Yeah, that, um, that really was uh, truly like every, every scene going like, what, what, what are we doing? What are we making? I'm not sure. Um, and it, you know, it feels like if you're making a comedy, you're on this sliding scale of like, how broad are we going? Like how understated and how broad? And um, because we weren't sure how much of it was even funny, it felt like, you know, you've got this sliding scale and you're comfortable playing with that. And then like the button comes off and you're like, oh God, it, I, it can go anywhere. What do I do with it? Um, so it was really hard to know, like, is it funny that you killed your sister? I don't know, like it's, cause it sort of is in some scenes. And and I don't, like Paul really, the Paul Feig, the director really pulled off a magic trick because it is so funny and so dark. And then the scenes that are scary and intense are really scary and intense. And I think while we were making it, we were thinking like, well, it has to be one or the other, surely. Um, but it, you know, we just got to do a lot of options and I love, I'm the queen of options. So I love like just doing, okay, I'm in this movie now, you know? I'm panicking. There's so many credits we need to get to. 90 minutes is not enough. You've accomplished quite a bit. I think the next one I want to hit is Paranorman. I love that movie. I love all Leica movies. And I believe that was your first time voicing a character in an animated feature. What did you learn about your own craft doing that when you're basically paring everything down and just focusing on a voice performance? Oh my gosh, it's so much fun. Yeah, voice work is so much fun. And I think that, again, love being on set, love acting on screen, but to have the sensation of getting a direction and doing it like faster than you can even process it, you're just doing it, is, was so freeing and it was like a nice reset after you know many years of like, you get the direction and then you're like, well, is it gonna be 30 seconds or is it gonna be 20 minutes? They're moving a light, oh God. Um, okay, I'll just sit on that and I won't overthink the note. Don't overthink the note. And yeah, and then doing it when there's been all this like build up is is really challenging. So I loved doing it, not because like oh, you get to do it in your sweatpants, which is great, <laughs> but um, <laughs> that yeah, that you get to just like the second that the intention kind of hits your brain, it's coming out of your mouth. Um, and I also loved being cast as this like 
curvaceous tall blonde. I was like, why would you cast me in this part? This is crazy. Um, like trolls makes more sense. It's like, oh yeah, she's like tiny and shrill. Got it. But um, that was, yeah, I loved that. It's a little Paranorman poster hanging up in my apartment. Oh, yeah. Love that movie. Um, I also love Joe Swanberg movies quite a bit. And I guess I'd have to start with Drinking Buddies. When you're about to jump into a film that essentially has no script, do you find that intimidating day one? Or are you looking forward to how freeing something like that could I be? was so scared. And I think everybody that came on was really scared, was sort of like taking a leap of faith. Um, and what I found, and then what I ended up finding out from everybody else that worked on that film was we, we all came in so worried that like we wouldn't know what to say. Like that's the big thing with an improv film. Like what if I just stand there and I don't know what to say? And we'd done all this kind of like uh, backstory work and character research and and then like you get there and it's like yeah no one's really interested in a scene where you describe how you became a teacher. Um, so that was great work but um, the, the juicier stuff is just two people in a room and like what they might mean to each other. And uh, that the challenge was actually not, oh God, I have to come up with something to say. The challenge was like, just listen, <laughs> just shut up and trust that you can be still and be interesting. And that's really hard, <laughs> uh, I think for a lot of performers, including me, very much me. And um, I was actually just thinking about the, the scene in the woods where um, Ron Livingston and I kiss, and um, and you know we sort of knew what the scene might be, and Joe came over and he was like, okay, you guys are all set up for your little picnic and do whatever, and uh, this is the scene where you, you kiss, and Ron went, I mean maybe we kiss, and I was like, oh I think we have to, I think that the the trajectory of the story and my character, like I think we have to kiss, but my character would never initiate a kiss. So like, or even say, will you kiss me? So like, how do I get him to kiss me? And we're like, I'm hearing like, and we're rolling and <laughs> the camera's set. And like, how do I get him to kiss me while knowing like I would never, the character wouldn't um, let on that she wanted to kiss him and so I ended up doing this weird thing where I was just like, suddenly, it was like silent for a long time and I was just suddenly like, I'm really nervous right now. And he sort of looked confused and then I was like, oh nothing, I th nothing. I thought, nothing, I'm sorry, I'm embarrassed, sorry. You know, like I've misread the situation basically. And then he felt so bad that he had to kiss me <laughs> to like <laughs> make me not feel like a jerk for thinking, is he about to kiss me? Um, and it was like the most terrifying and uh, fun thing and thank God Joe was like, that was great. I think we can move on. Because I was like, I can't do that again. Whatever that was, I can't do that again. <laughs> and then I had the really interesting experience of knowing my character also would tell my boyfriend what just happened and nobody's gonna give me the words to do that. So as soon as we wrapped that moment and I was like, oh, okay, great. And I started crying because I was like, oh, I have to tell Jake Johnson that I've done this. And like, I have to find the right moment. And I don't have a page to tell me like, well, you know, I open with this and here's how I frame it. And I was really surprised by like how embarrassed and ashamed I was because I didn't know what I would say and I didn't know what he would say. And that was like a really nice, in a similar, but in a different way, like, it, but it had a similar effect of like voice work where it's like a reset, where it's like you can get back in touch with the stuff that's actually coming up versus the stuff that you're kind of conjuring. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I get that. Um, Joe's movies are very specific in how he makes it. Are there any specific tools you can isolate that you've been able to apply to the films that you've done after and made them better with those particular uh, skill sets? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think the lesson that I'm gonna be learning my whole life is that I can trust that I can be still and that um, I don't have to be like creating uh, an exciting moment every frame. Um, I, I think that's um, 
that's the thing that I most wanted to tell anybody that was auditioning for the movie that I just made. And the thing that I most want to like tell myself all the time is like, you're, you're fine, you're interesting, you're compelling, you don't have to be like pushing for it. Um, and I mean, I guess that feels like a lesson I'm going to be learning my whole career and then also my whole life is like, y you're, you're fine. You know, you can just be still and be compelling, you know? It's making me think of something you brought up when we spoke at TIFF, and I think it could be very, very useful for any actor out there. The idea of getting stuck in the routine of acting for Video Village and that like, okay, we got it. When did you first notice that that had become a habit that you needed to break, and then ultimately what was the key to breaking it? Well, yeah, so I don't even know that it was something that I consciously wanted to break because it feels good. Um, you know, when, uh, and I don't want to denigrate the skill set that got me there. Uh, like, so when I, I guess like when I think about making love life, I wanted to be this team player. I want to be the star student. It makes me feel comfortable and safe. And I want to be the little apple polisher that everybody at Video Village goes, ah, you know, oh, Kendrick, you can rely on her. You know, she just bam, 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 right? And uh, I do want to be that person, and I'm proud of those tools. I'm proud of the work that I did to become the kind of person who was aware of camera. Um, and then um, my life really changed. Um, I had some bad personal times, and I felt like if I'm going to make a, my next movie, because um, I took a some time off because things in my life were really falling apart. And I was like, if I'm gonna make another movie, I really want to um, do something different and something smaller. A and I don't mean smaller like the size of the movie, the budget. I, I mean, I wanted to be smaller and, um, and more still and in invite people in <laughs> rather than like doing, using the same tools that I've begun to reach for over and over again. And I'm, I'm proud of developing those tools, but at the same time I was like, I don't know that I want to please Video Village because I don't know that Video Village is always right. And um, it was a very uncomfortable sensation to be making Alice Darling and to not be getting the like daily, hourly attaboys. Um, and to know that, like, I don't know if they think this scene is working, but I believe that I'm building a whole performance. And I know that Alice does not seem very likable at first. And I know that for the first 15 minutes, people might not love her. And I know how to um, be a likable character on screen. And I didn't want to kind of save the cat in the first act because I wanted to trust that I could do that as a performer, but really more importantly, I wanted to trust that you don't have to be in a great place mentally for people to still have compassion for you. And the process of that was really valuable to me because I was coming out of a situation where I had no self-trust. And it was like an exercise <laughs> in rebuilding that self-trust to go like, I'm gonna tolerate how uncomfortable it makes me feel that there's this scene towards the end of the movie where I make a very strange choice. And I think it's, I think, I don't even know if people who see the movie would think of it as a strange choice, but on set, I totally got why everyone was like, what are you doing? <laughs> hey babe, what are you doing? Um, and uh, I felt like, oh, I'm being a very weird scene partner. I'm being a weird employee. Um, but I fucking knew it was right. And I knew it was right because I had lived it. And it was like, I also trusted that the audience, the viewer, I was like, I keep saying the audience, but it's like I'm sort of imagining like a viewer would be coming along with me. And um, once, especially because this is that this particular scene is in the third act, that it was like, if you're in, you're in, and I am trusting that you're gonna be with me, even though this seems strange. So 
Hey, that's a really weird thing to say when I'm like being very vague about this, what I'm talking about. I but. hope it encourages everyone here to see the movie because having seen it, I can feel what you're explaining and, and it's, it's mighty powerful in a way to dig a little further into Alice Darling without you know, spoiling the tail end of the movie and how things evolve for her. What would you say is the biggest difference between how you envision the movie turning out, jumping in, compared to what the final product wound up being? Um, you know what's funny? Um, I mean, I don't know if this really gets to like the, the, the juice of that question, but the, the first thing that jumps to mind was something that was very specific. I mean, it happens all the time in movies you, that like there's a, a piece of a storyline that, you know, you while you're making it, you're like, well, this is absolutely integral to the story. And then you see it and you're like, huh, I didn't even notice it was gone. Um, <laughs> and there was a, so there was this kind of B plot in the movie about, I think this is fun. I mean, you guys have seen it, whatever. You know, like, you, we've all had stuff cut out, and you're like, oh, okay. Um, but uh, it, it feels like uh, dangerous to talk about a film as though it wasn't always exactly as it turned out. And, but, I, you it know, feels we're all adults, It feels you know? more dangerous to do the opposite and give the impression that it turns out the I exact way it started. I could not agree more. I feel like there are a lot of younger people who think that, like, if it's not exactly as it is on the page like t and don't cover their asses you know and like don't want to do options and whatever i think it's it's like a very confident thing to know that you might be wrong um but uh the there was a b plot about um uh like there was a, a health scare alice was having a health scare and on paper it felt like totally necessary because on paper it was already such a lean story like such a sparse story that it felt like there had to be something, you know, other than just like, there's a lady and she's uh, not doing great. <laughs> and that's the movie. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then you kind of realize like, oh, that's gone and you don't miss it at all. And it, again, if anything, like that just more solidified like, oh, like I, I'm enough, you know? Just the, um, again, like as a performer, that was really valuable to me. But like, oh, we don't need Alice to also be having a health scare to be like, this girl is in fucking trouble. And um, that, again, personally was so valuable to me to be like, oh, the, the viewer is in and cares and wants her to be OK and is very concerned about her without a weird health scare subplot, you know? Fair enough. You no, I love the ensemble in this movie. I think the three of you are just absolutely perfect together. Can you give us an example of a scene that you found really challenging, but because of what one of them gave you as a scene partner, you were able to reach something in Alice that you wouldn't have been able to without them? I mean, my obsession with Ganya Dio, who plays Tess, is well documented now. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I basically followed her around like a baby bird. I was so in love with her. Um, she, I'm like very into like tall, stoic, badass, dry women. Um, and so my goal every day was like to make her laugh. You know, like when a cat crawls into your lap and you're like, yeah. um, like if I could make her laugh, I was like, yes. Um, Cause she just doesn't kind of give you anything. Um, but then uh, Woonmi is so radiant and so lovely and so inviting. And um, it's really strange because there were so many times where I was like, this is the correct thing for the scene and for the movie, but I'm not being a present scene partner because I'm not present as a character. Like, I, I can't be here. And the more that she would like radiate joy and love and acceptance for me, I was like, I can't deal with that because Alice is not at a place where she can accept that. So it was really helpful to my performance and strange to not be able to like, lean into that and reciprocate that. Um, but it was really helpful in terms of like, this person really sees me and I as Alice cannot tolerate that she sees me and I have to shut down more and more and more, if that makes sense. Definitely does. Looking ahead, based on your Alice Darling experience, is there any particular thing you accomplished, whether it was as a producer on the movie or as a star tackling a really challenging role that you can kind of like keep in your back pocket and might make you think, if I was able to accomplish that, I can do anything? Oh, God. Um, 
Oh no. <laughs> you guys haven't seen the movie. I can't talk about certain things. Um, there's a scene that I forget about every time that, that um, yeah, I, it's, that was definitely one where I was like, well, I've done that now and my mom's gonna see the movie, so, oh my God, um, great. Oh, you'll know it when you see it. Um, uh, but like, that was a, it's funny because that was a day that I uh, was really in the middle of like, don't take on anybody else's job, that's their job, and they are good at their job. So like, trust them and trust yourself and take care of yourself. And there was, uh, in that scene, there was a moment where I, uh, hurt myself a little I, I you know like when you're on set it's like you I don't know about you guys but I end up like hitting my knees a bunch I end up like getting like weird micro injuries because it's like it's not an environment that I know very well and then there's cables and whatever and I end up with like mystery bruises and whatever and I managed to <laughs> scrape the top of my foot um, doing this one thing and then I kept scraping it you know like where you're you're trying not to think about it and not protect your body in that one piece of blocking. But then every time I was like, oh, I'm scraping my foot again. And um, the, uh, and I, and I, like, it was a radical act for me to say, hey, before we go for the next take, can someone please find me a Band-Aid? Because like, I've wanted to be like the trooper and the gold star fucking student. And like, yeah, 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 let's just keep going and I'll, it's fine. And to say like, it's gonna take 60 seconds you know, just get the Band-Aid and then you won't be thinking about it was like a bizarre and uh, wonderful act. That sounds really pathetic. Like I'm, I'm being very like, I don't even ask for Band-Aids, guys. <laughs> but I, but it, it is nothing, I don't know, it has nothing to do with anything other than like just a, an innate sort of long, decades long sense of like, I can like keep the stip of her lip and that's how I kind of get praise and stay safe and um, like to say, no, I would, pref if we can, I would prefer to, you know, just grab a Band-Aid <laughs> was awesome. I get it. I slammed my finger in a door really bad once during shooting and I didn't say anything no! until, until the day was wrapped. Yeah. I don't want to derail anything. That's, yeah. not the, that's not the way I should have handled totally. that. Totally. <laughs> no, but I, I get it. Are you kidding? I'll never forget that. <laughs> just brought all those memories flooding back in. <laughs> Wonderful. Look, thank you. <laughs> looking, looking ahead, I'm actually going to refer back to something Mary had brought up during our TIFF interview, and I haven't forgotten this thing, and I have asked this question a lot, and she planted this seed in my head. But, Is this the secret thing? Oh, I love this question. I love it so, so much. So at TIFF, Mary, the director of Alice Darling, told me a Joe Wright quote where a director, when they're about to take on a new script, should have a secret about that script, something to make it uniquely their own. So when it comes to the dating game, what is something uniquely your own that you found in that script that proved to you that, like, this is my first feature as a director? God, that's so funny. I, it's, um, I don't want to speak too soon. I mean, we wrapped on Friday, no, or not this Friday, the previous Friday. We, uh, yeah, wrapped principal photography a week ago Friday. And um, so it feels very weird to say anything about it because it's also like I, I was aware that there were times when the movie was telling me what it was about. And that sounds very like like woo woo or whatever. But I was really like, no, you are not. And then it kept being like, yeah, babe, this is what I, this is what the movie's about. And like to embrace that was great. And I don't know how many more times I will have to do that. And I will try to be open to that process. Um, but I will say that I think um, the, um, the crux of the question came up for me when I sent it to a couple filmmaker friends to be like, would it be totally insane for me to direct my first feature? Prep starts in six weeks. Um, uh, this is the timeline and this is, you know, like, here's the script and like, do you think this is totally insane? Like, talk me out of it, you know? And um, a friend of mine who put me in my first union film, uh, uh, Jeff Blitz, he directed me in Rocket Science. Um, I sent it to him and he was like, I, I will say that this, like, just even from the opening scene, I was like, very surprised that this was the thing that made you go, this is what I want to make my first feature, like, so why this? And I did feel like, oh, I, I, I barely understood, like, how you don't see it. Like, I, I was like, 
because it's about shame. Like I, t I knew why he was like, it feels a little genre-y or something. Like I totally, totally got why he would look at it on paper and go like, this isn't really your wheelhouse, <laughs> darling. Um, but I was like, but I, it is because it's about shame and I know a lot about shame. So yeah, I think that felt like the secret I went in with. Can't wait to see it. I got all the faith in you seeing it through to fruition. Now I know it's a scary part of the process. Um, I'm going to go to the audience questions in a moment, but I feel like there's going to be people that are very, very angry if I don't ask a specific pitch perfect question. Oh. And I completely breezed over that like epic franchise in your career. The, the question I had for that one was, I saw in another interview that you were talking about how like, things were just crazy on the first movie. And you pretty much never learned. You were always like, everybody on the team was like getting it down to the wire and you were prepping yeah. last minute for things. So of everything you shot over the course of those three films, which particular scene made you think the most like, oh my, I don't know if we're actually gonna pull it together in time. Oh yeah, yeah, so for all three movies, it like got worse as it went along. <laughs> like the second movie, everybody went into rehearsals like, remember the first movie was so crazy and like disorganized, but now we're a well-oiled machine. No, um, it, the second movie was like crazier and weirder and things kept changing, like the, the music kept changing which meant the choreography kept changing. Um, and then the third one was, yeah, a total free for all. Um, yeah, what was the, I feel like, uh, I think the, oh god, now they've all blended into one, just so much choreography. Um, I feel like the closest to the wire that things felt was maybe the finale of number two, where um, I think we learned the choreography that weekend. Um, it was simple, but still. Um, our, I don't know, it was, it was chaotic. I'm like having PTSD flashbacks. <laughs> um, but uh, I think it was, more like, I think that we all thought that like, you know, every three years we make a musical and like we'll get better at um, learning, like picking up choreography. And we're just totally ignoring the fact that we were all like just getting older and our brains were declining. Cause it was like, this is so much harder. Um, and we're like, AJ, is the choreography harder this time? He was like, no. <laughs> okay, um, sorry. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. It was always like very, very down to the wire. Um, and we were always relying on uh, like Shelly. So there's the two, I don't know if you guys knew, but there's two girls in the movie where the whole joke is that we never let them speak. And um, uh, Shelly, the brunette, was like the, is the best dancer. And so she's sort of the dance captain. So you could always kind of go to her to be like, wait, what am, where am I supposed to go for this thing? And uh, Kelly, the blonde, is the, the best musician. So um, she's the person to be like, wait, what's my harmony? And she like knows everybody's part and everything. So they're like really like the, the workhorses in the heart of the team. So very grateful to them. Whatever chaotic energy was going on throughout that trilogy, it worked. Those movies are a delight. I'm gonna squeeze in one more before I go to the stack of cards here, because I also have to ask about Into the Woods. Mm. You've had your fair share of uh, movie musical experience. What is a unique challenge that's specific to a Sondheim musical that you encountered while oh, making that? Oh, man, yeah. Um, Sondheim is so hard. It's so wonderful and so hard. And, um, I, I, you know, I, I've, I love this about Sondheim. But it is like, as a, as a musician, it's hard. I don't even, I mean, whatever, a musician, I feel very silly even like putting myself in that category. But um, as a musician, very challenging. But as an actor, really interesting because it feels like you're getting a line reading because the melody is not really, um, uh, uh, it, I don't know, it's not there to like, just evoke a, a tone and a feeling and an atmosphere. It, it's so specific and it changes and there's like these little rhythm changes and pitch changes for a line that feels like it should be an exact repeat. And it, so it ends up feeling like he's giving you a line reading and you have some freedom within that. But um, I don't know, I think that's like a really interesting way to work to go like, well, this is the line reading and, I, and this is the, the weird framework that I have to work within. Um, but there was something about that that 
I think we all liked a lot, that it was like, there's a piece of the performance that's not up to me. And so I can do with it what I want in these other ways, but you know, the, like, literally like the intonation, I, I, you know, he, he wrote it down and I have to do it that way. I lie, one more question, but I think this might be useful to get an answer to. When you're in a situation where you really want to trust your own instinct, instincts, but also respect, you know, the director's vision or what the totally. writer wanted yeah. initially, how do you go about balancing all of that? Yeah, I mean, God, yeah, that's the, that, I, and, I, and I've said before that I think my favorite feeling on set is to have so much trust with the director that they say something to me that I'm like, that is the worst fucking idea I've ever heard, let's do it. Um, because it's like, I just trust you and I know that there's something I'm not seeing, so great. You know, that's like, that's such a wonderful feeling. And, um, and even sometimes I'm like watching uh, the actor that I'm in the scene with do something that to me seems crazy, but if you trust them, you're like, all right, I'm gonna join you over there. I don't get it, but let's go over here now, you know? Um, and that is one of the many beautiful things about acting on film is like these things can be decided and pieced together later. So it's not like a theater performance. Like you, you get to try all these different things and then like, you know, hand it over to somebody and say like, whatever it is, I trust that you will make it the right thing, you know? I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna go to your questions because you have great questions. I will start with Carolyn. Can you share a story about your first breakthrough audition? Mm. Um, oh, you know, the, um, a thing that I think about all the time is that uh, when I was little, when I was you know, 11 or 12, uh, I would audition for Broadway shows and I would be so nervous and we're all so fucking nervous. And um, you know, I, I, I think sometimes I would get callbacks, but um, it, you know, just never quite right. And then uh, Jay Bender, who um, ended up casting me in High Society, uh, I walked into that audition and I had green nail polish and uh, he like called me over to the audition table and made me show him my hands and was like, your mom let you wear that? And, um, and he you know, was like, that's really cool. You've got such a cool mom. And like, it gave me the opportunity to like, crack some jokes and be a person. And it just like broke the ice enough that I think like it's not an accident that that was the thing that I ended up booking as my very first job. Um, so I think just like, allowing people to be um, uh, not feel like a commodity uh, was so valuable. That was like, I don't know if he was doing that to every girl all day going, what, those pink shoelaces? Come here, I need to see that. If, you know, like, if that was brilliant, if that's what he was doing. Um, I also think that uh, a while ago, um, I, I started going into anything that I do audition for and going, I'm really nervous. Like just, it just like takes it out of the room and suddenly we're all holding it together. And it's not just me holding it and pretending I'm not holding it. It's like, hey, this is all in the room and like we can be uh, like experiencing that together. It, it's not like it magically makes it go away permanently, but I couldn't believe how valuable that was to just go in and go, man, I am so nervous. <laughs> Like I'm going to start every junket interview with, I'm so nervous I'm so before nervous. we talk. Um, this one's from Kira. I'm 14 and I'm wondering what advice you have for someone who's first starting out. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess say you're nervous. Yeah. Like really, I can't tell you how valuable it was to me and when people would say that or anything like that when they were auditioning for me, it was like, okay, let's slow down together, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I also think, again, the lesson I'm gonna be learning my whole life is like, you can do less and be interesting. Like almost the less you do, the more interesting you are. And it's and I say that as someone who is like living my whole life and career trying to learn that lesson. So it's not like coming from a place of like, we'll just do this. It's like, this is the aspiration is to, to trust that you're interesting. Love that way of looking at it. Um, apologies, this one does not have a name on it. Do you uh, reach out at all to directors, writers, producers on projects that you want to be a part of, or do you only get to have um, an opportunity to get those via an agent or manager? 
Oh, that's interesting. Um, I I don't, and I I there are other people that do, and I'm and I'm so uh, envious of that quality, and I, I think I should do it more. Um, but uh, I did. I will also say because I feel like you only hear the stories about like. Um, oh, I always think about how you, we always hear that story about Elijah Wood like dressing up as Frodo for his audition and how he got it, but you don't hear about the ones that dress up as Frodo and don't get the job. And, um, and it's, uh, and I, I did once like reach out to a uh, director because I read this script and was like loved it so much and I like wrote this whole very personal thing. This was years ago, but um, I did not get the job, <laughs> and like that's one of those things where you're like, yeah, and I survived. I'm not dead. It's fine. It didn't kill me, but it was embarrassing. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's good to like say that that happens and that's fine because it's weird that you th those those moments of like I'm gonna go for it are so mythologized as like, and that's the thing that got me the job, and we don't talk about it when it's like, oh, I did that and I really put myself on the line and it didn't work. Because um, it's embarrassing, and I, but I feel like that actually frees you up more to be like, well, okay, like, so life's embarrassing. <laughs> Embrace the embarrassment yeah. and also the fact that you were passionate about it and wanted it. There's yeah. something very valid in that, too. This question comes from Lucy. Were there any moments in your career where you thought you'd give up or quit? What made you keep going? Oh, man. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, there were definitely moments where, like, the money was running out, and you're like, I don't really know what happens now. Um, uh, and I, I remember actually being on um, A Little Night Music when I was 17, and one of the actresses who was like in her 20s at the time um, was uh, talking about herself like being on that journey constantly of like the money's about to run out, and that she just had to get herself into this place of like trusting that the money would come. That just in terms of like, I will make enough to just cover this next month's rent. And um, I, I know that that's not always true, <laughs> but uh, for some reason, just hearing that was like, okay, I'm just gonna, there's nothing I can do about it. So I am just gonna trust that I will book something just enough to get me through the next month and I won't get kicked out of this apartment. And uh, that may mean that I have to bring a cashier's check down to the uh, uh, LADWP, um, but that's okay. And um, yeah, I, I, I guess like a kind of blind faith sometimes, like a real, um, like that mix of like horrible anxiety with some kind of magical thinking, frankly. Like any of this is all a little bit insane. So there was a little bit of just like choosing to be, um, have to choosing to have more faith than I probably should have, if that makes sense. We've got to wind down soon. I'm gonna squeeze in two more questions here. Uh, this one's from Joy. How did you get to know Paul Feig? Merry Christmas and Happy Hanukkah. Oh, um, I mean, uh, yeah, I think I'd met Paul a couple of times before A Simple Favor, and he is, um, he really is like everything you want him to be. You know, he's the, like, there was a day that I was like, we're filming in a swamp, there's no way he's still gonna wear that three-piece suit. But uh, he wore a linen three-piece suit because we were in the swamp. Um, and, uh, I, but I think that the most striking quality about him, obviously like people comment on the fact that he always wears a three-piece suit, but is like he just is so um, gentle and he's so good at giving people the benefit of the doubt. Like you cannot get that man to talk shit. It's actually very frustrating for me sometimes. <laughs> um, but he's so um, like thoughtful and he's so good at reframing. And so whenever anybody is, um, you know, having a bad time. He's very good at like just being understanding and not taking it personally. And I should be grateful for that because there were definitely, um, I, I tease him that like I asked him so many questions on that movie because there's so many double crosses and like what do I know, what does she know? Um, that I was like, oh, you're gonna have like nightmare PTSD situations about me like being like, Paul, what is, 
Um, that's gonna like haunt his dream is my shrill voice going, Paul. Um, but uh, yeah, he's been um, a, a wonderful friend and um, I was so happy to work on Love Life with him and I hope that we get to work together more in the future. I mean, we're making a simple favor too, which I can't wait for. Yes. But um, yeah, I, I feel really grateful to call him a friend. Simple favor too. Yeah. Simple plan too. Simple, simple plan favor. too. I'll take simple I'll plan make that too, too also. Come yeah, on. please both. Um, I love this question, so we're gonna wrap here. This is from Julia. How are you able to live in and appreciate the present moment when as actors we're always striving for more? Woof. Yeah. Oh my god. I feel like acting or not, that's just like if you have any advice, everyone should take it. Yeah, I mean, but that is a hard question because it is like, I don't, tell you tell me. Oh my God. I mean, that's the, yeah, that's the whole goal. And I, I mean, I will say that sometimes I have to remind myself, oh, I'm gonna be so corny. Ooh, I hate it. Um, that um, I think that I have, um, hmm, I, I've grabbed enough brass rings to know that the next one will not heal me. And it's really disappointing. <laughs> I know, because it feels like just one more and I'll be okay with myself. And um, it's, uh, it's also, I think, helpful for me to give myself the grace to know you're probably still gonna fantasize about like just another um, accomplishment or another attaboy from Video Village like making you feel good forever and you will probably still chase those attaboys and like that's okay too. Um, so yeah I think for me the more that I chastise myself for um, uh, counterproductive behavior like that the more I'll end up enacting it. So I think the first thing to do is to like take the lid of shame off the behavior to give it some room to maybe change. Cause the more that I'm like, stop doing that, the more that it kind of makes me rigid. So I think, yeah, like telling myself, like if you fall into that trap again, whether it's tomorrow or in a year, that's okay. And like you understand why and um, yeah, I think that's the, the hardest part is to like allow yourself to have the, um, the desire to like reach for something that's gonna do something for you that we know better, we know it's not. Um, but uh, I, I think to not shame yourself about it is the, is the best way to give it some breathing room. Absolutely. That's, that's why I wanted to hit that one. I knew you'd give me something to chew on and I'm sure everybody out there we have to say goodbye. Anna, huge, huge, huge Thank congratulations so on me. Alice Darling and everything you've Thank accomplished. You Thank you all for your really questions. Happy. If I could just ask you to remain seated for a minute so we can zip on out and Anna can get to her next thing. Thank you Thank again. Thank you so much. Really, this was awesome. Thank you.